I will. Thank you, Dean. And thank you for joining us at our uh, first uh, attack chat for um, October 7th. I'll go ahead and, and welcome everyone. We have a, a, a good crowd and it seems to be growing as we speak. Um, I also would um, just take a moment to recognize our leadership level partners. I'm not going to read all their names, but you see them there on your screen. It's always interesting that the audience sometimes um, revolves around a topic. And today, I think from a health insurance point of view, from pandemic point of view, from uh, vaccinations, numbers, masks, those type of things, this is a timely topic. And we have our friends from DHEC with us um, this afternoon and um, the doctors Fredera and Dr. Carlson, and they're going to jump right in and, and lead us on our discussion. Thank you for coming, um, and I'll turn it over to our DHEC friends. All right, um, so good afternoon, and I am going to share my screen. Give me just a second here. All right. Um, so uh, welcome today, and uh, and uh, I hope y'all are having a good day today. We've got a, a good bit of information here to, to go through. Um, Dean, just checking. You can see my PowerPoint, right? Yes, we're all okay. good. Perfect, perfect. Um, lots of information here to go through today, uh, and Dr. Carlson and I will be tag teaming this. Um, so it's going to go really quickly for you because we, we dumped a lot of data into this and a lot of information for you, but we, you will get these slides so you can uh, dive a little more deeply into them. Um, but for uh, uh, just general consensus here and so that y'all have an awareness of who we are, uh, I'm the, the public health director for the upstate region with DHEC. Dr. Carlson is the medical director for, for DHEC in the upstate region. We cover the top 11 counties uh, in the upstate area. So you see in this map here, those 11 counties represented. It's basically the 10 at the top counties plus McCormick. Um, so uh, we cover that same kind of catchment area for, um, for the upstate. So we cover a variety of topics um, that are uh, more public health focused, not so much the environmental side. That's a different group uh, within DHEC. Um, and I was telling Dean earlier, it, it's going to be nice one day for us to have a non-COVID conversation in public health. But you know, think about TB, STDs, um, other reportable conditions, um, chronic disease, maternal child health. There's lots going on in, in public health uh, beyond COVID. But today we're going to focus ma mainly on COVID. Um, what uh, our staff do and their role in this response, uh, you see here uh, a variety of different um, topics as it relates to COVID. So everything from case investigations and diving deep into those actual positive cases and doing interviews, uh, figuring out who the contacts are to those cases and tracing them down and, 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 and finding those individuals. Um, all the way through testing clinics, vaccine clinics, um, broader community education uh, is another focus of ours, um, but lots of partnership and systems collaborations and those underlying uh, that, that fabric of support, if you will, within a region, uh, our staff are, are supportive of. And then just providing general guidance and support. BHEC does a lot of recommending, lots of providing guidance uh, and, and trying to help entities um, decipher all the different clinical trials and, and research that's out there for COVID. So Dr. Carlson, uh, I'm going to turn it over to her in just a second. She's going to talk to you about the impact of the disease. And um, she has uh, with her today um, a, a great number and, and a great deal of, of research, clinical-based studies. They're going to give you an idea of the breadth and depth of um, the research that's out there for COVID. And, and what we're basing our decisions off of. Um, so Dr. Carlson, I'm gonna turn it over to you to start talking about the disease itself. Okay, all right. Well, thank you again for uh, joining us today. Um, it's a, a topic obviously that's commanded a lot of our attention over the last year and a half um, coming up on two years. And there's a reason, and there's a good reason that we devote so much attention to this disease. Uh, COVID-19 has, has 
taken so many lives away and altered all of our lives. In fact, it was the third leading cause of death in 2020. And that is an astounding uh, fact. So heart disease had, took 690,000 lives in the US, cancer 598,000 lives, and COVID 345,000 lives in 2020. Here uh, you can see the epidemic or pandemic curve in this case uh, on our website. If anybody is not familiar, I encourage you to go look at the, the South Carolina DHEC website. We put up lots of uh, data every day and in different formats. So this is one of the main formats. If you look at uh, the dashboard of the latest data, this tells the COVID-19 cases per day that are reported and it's a count of confirmed, and that requires a PCR positive confirmation of the virus, or a probable, but most of the cases are confirmed here, but the probable cases also require either a antigen test, or uh, they have to be closely epidemiologically linked to a close contact. And what that means is that we have carefully identified that they came into contact with somebody with COVID, and then they developed symptoms that were consistent with COVID. So these are not, um, these are not just mere um, numbers that we put up. These are all carefully adjudicated cases. And as you can see, there have been three uh, waves. Uh, the highest peak was last winter, but we have just crested the wave that was related to the Delta variant. The Delta variant was, um, that's fine, we can, was um, more transmissible and rose quickly. Um, and it is now, uh, we've peaked and we're on a downward trend and we're hoping that that trend stays. Uh, but we know that the holidays are coming and people will be more indoors and there are still susceptible members of our community. And the next slide tells us, as of October 3rd, there were 867,326 confirmed and probable cases. Now, <clears throat> the number has risen since then. That was um, last, you know, data rises every day. The data is updated. 29,000 of those confirmed and probable cases were hospitalized. That's 3.4% nearly of all known cases. In terms of deaths, we've already surpassed uh, this number, unfortunately, but 12,729 deaths were reported as of October 3rd, and that was 1.47% of known cases. Just in comparison, oh. I won't, that's fine, I can talk about the deaths in a minute, but in comparison, flu is less uh, fatal of a disease in general. The usual flu is less. In terms of the rate of COVID-19, um, that in, in the cases per 10,000 population over the last month, you can see on our website, you can see the case rates by county. Um, and that gives us a different picture of what's happening because it's one thing to talk about the total numbers. It's another to talk about the number per population. Uh, as you can see in the last uh, month of data, the darker colors are the higher case rates. So the upstate has had higher rates of COVID cases reported. Go next. And the impact of the disease in the hospitals cannot be overstated. I used to work in a hospital as a hospitalist in uh, different hospitals, both in South Carolina, Georgia, and in Massachusetts. And I can tell you the idea that 18% of patients in the hospital are there because of one diagnosis is astounding. Um, you know, this, the stress that this has placed on our healthcare providers is just overwhelming. Um, with nearly one in five patients hospitalized for COVID and 33% of the ICU pac patients there related to their COVID diagnosis, it, it has put an incredible uh, stress. We, um, <clears throat> we should know that this is decreased now, fortunately, a little bit since a couple of weeks ago, 
but this is still a tremendous uh, uh, burden on our hospitals and our healthcare workers who have been exhausted uh, every day going to take care of uh, very sick patients who often stay for longer than the usual patients, particularly if they're on life support and require um, prolonged ventilatory support. Our uh, death rate um, in South Carolina uh, from the beginning of the, of the pandemic to now is uh, 248 per 100,000 population. It is slightly above the national rate of 212 per 100,000. You can see the darker uh, states are with higher death rates. Uh, so <clears throat> Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and uh, Nevada. I think that's, um, I'm sorry, that's not Nevada. That's New Mexico. New Mexico. <laughs> Has higher rate. Um, and then of course, uh, New Jersey and Massachusetts. Um, you know, I put this slide in, uh, the burden of mortality is largely on older uh, adults, uh, but there are younger people who have died. And particularly in the last uh, Delta wave, we've seen more younger people hospitalized, uh, predominantly because they were the unvaccinated. And uh, we have lost young people to this illness, including at least six children here in South Carolina, uh, 10 or under and 15 uh, adolescents. Uh, and, and I think the numbers are a little bit higher already. Uh, we continue to receive uh, reports. All of the deaths that are counted are counted very carefully. We have there multiple people are double checking. Um, I will also tell you that we do not determine um, their cause of death, that is a healthcare professional that writes that on the death certificate. So uh, it is, these are deaths that are with COVID as a cause or a contributing factor. We'll go next. And the deaths are not evenly distributed everywhere. Um, deaths are are counted by the county of residence, not the county of uh, the person's hospitalization, uh, in case uh, anybody is wondering. So these are all residents who are um, represented in these maps. And this is all on our website. It's, uh, COVID is not just about um, hospitalization and um, dying. Uh, there are uh, prolonged cases of symptoms where maybe two out of three people have at least um, one of these symptoms within months after their hospitalization. Of course, if you've had COVID pneumonia, you're more likely to have fibrosis, which is scarring of the lungs and prolonged shortness of breath and fatigue. Um, People also describe uh, pains. Of course, they lose their sense of taste and smell and uh, brain fog is also described frequently. Um, most people uh, recover, uh, but it, this is requiring a lot of people a lot longer to recuperate from. Children also can experience uh, effects after their initial illness. Uh, we have reported at least 135 cases of multi-inflammatory syndrome in children. And this is not a mild illness when this occurs. Uh, these are children who come in often with findings of heart failure, abnormal uh, troponin levels, which is an, a protein that's released when the heart muscle is damaged. Uh, they come in requiring oxygen or maybe breathing support. Sometimes they have kidney failure, severe abdominal pain. And this syndrome is some kind of immune imbalance and inflammatory syndrome that occurs often two to three weeks after the original illness. And the original illness can be quite mild. Um, so uh, it's not benign in every child either. 
And we do have ways to prevent this illness. And that's what we need to really focus on. We have tools, we can, we, we can help mitigate um, the risk to our loved ones and our community. So we have, um, is, I don't know if uh, Dr. Ferdier wanted to speak to this. I'm, I, I can go forth. <laughs> go, go for it, you're good. Okay, <laughs> okay. All right, so uh, we already talked about how we, um, you know, we do testing through DHEC and obviously um, other places are doing testing, frequent testing if you're a close contact or if you are um, obviously with any symptoms, but if you're in quarantine, we have some testing recommendations. Uh, isolation if you are positive uh, and you are a case so that you prevent um, spreading the disease. These things are important. Uh, often people can spread, they can be contagious before they develop symptoms. So maybe one half to two thirds of, of cases are related to spread before the development of symptoms or in an asymptomatic, uh, from an asymptomatic person. So testing, even people who are without symptoms is important. Social distancing is still important, staying out of crowded uh, indoor spaces. If you are indoors uh, to wear a mask because um, you, you uh, want to protect yourself and others. And of course, uh, getting vaccinated is critical. Masks uh, have been a source of uh, debate uh, quite a bit, but there is good evidence now that, um, that masking helps and masks are <clears throat> now being shown in several studies to have reduced uh, the risk of COVID outbreaks. So this one study that was published from St. Louis University was notably before the Delta variant uh, was prominent. So we know with the Delta variant, the viral loads are higher. I, I'm not sure that you know, the exact numbers would be applicable um, because the Delta variant was more transmissible with that higher viral load. But nonetheless, when the study was done, they looked at individuals who had been masked uh, and who were unmasked in the university. And they noted that if both were uh, unmasked or if one were unmasked, there was a 4.9 times higher chance of infection if they had a close contact with somebody who was sick. Any additional exposure were associated with a 40% increase in the odds of a positive test result. So it was it was clear that it was kind of a dose response relationship, if you will, between the numbers of times that you were next to that person um, who was contagious at the time. There was a recent study that was published out of Arizona uh, schools where they had 1,020 schools reporting uh, and they could look at schools that had implemented early mass requirements uh, compared with schools that had no uh, mask requirements. And they noted that the schools where there were no mask requirements, there were 3.5 times more likely to have a COVID-19 outbreak in that school. This slide, I know it's a little busy, a little bit harder to um, interpret, but it was another study that looked at multiple counties um, in different parts of the United States where there were mask requirements and where there weren't. So the dark blue bars represent the counties without the school mask requirement and the lighter blue bars had the school mask requirement. The, the y-axis is the mean change in daily number of COVID cases per 100,000 children and adolescents. And the x-axis looks at three weeks before the start of school to two weeks after the start of school. It's, it's a little um, odd the way they, they do this description, but you see the, the bar that's on the X axis is the, the start of school. And then they're just comparing the change from before to after. So if you just even look at the, at the, the highest bar here, you can see, uh, 
that it's over 60 um, cases per 100,000 children compared to just over 20. I mean, there's a, a large difference and that's looking at the change from week, uh, three weeks before the start to two weeks after. So there's, there's a fairly clear and consistent um, you know, bit of evidence coming out that the mask requirements work. It just it kind of makes sense. You're gonna, if everybody has to wear the mask, then there's a reduction of the viral uh, load in the air, the droplets and, and all just are reduced. And really, I know that people had questioned if masks are dangerous somehow, but they're really not. There has not been any good scientific evidence that masks cause carbon dioxide retention or low oxygen or increase your risk of bacterial infection. It's, it, there just isn't, it's just not there if you keep a clean mask. So how do you select a mask? You'd like to have one that has two or more layers of washable, breathable fabric. It has to cover your nose and mouth um, and fit somewhat snugly. Uh, you don't wanna have it hanging on your chin. I know <clears throat> I, know I see that a lot. Um, and, and it would be better if you have a little wire on the top to prevent the air from leaking out of the top of the mask. Um, so if you have a valve on the, on the mask or a vent, then that probably is allowing virus particles to escape. Uh, this, I think this little diagram was made when we were really lacking uh, personal protective equipment for healthcare workers. So they were trying to dissuade people from using N95 respirators on a regular basis. To my knowledge, we don't have that supply chain issue right now. Uh, now, I saved the, the best for last, um, the, the uh, immunization. So vaccines are safe and effective. Uh, we have three brands of vaccines right now that are available. The Pfizer brand is the only one that is authorized for uh, younger people. So people 12 years and older can receive a Pfizer uh, vaccine. And it consists of a series of two shots given at least three weeks apart. Um, there's, we, we try to adhere to the three weeks. Um, you can give it a few days after, but that's what it's authorized for. And you're considered fully vaccinated two weeks after your second shot. Moderna is similar. It's also an mRNA-based vaccine, and it's available for people 18 years and older, and their spacing is 28 days apart. Um, as you probably know, uh, the Pfizer vaccine received a full FDA approval for 16 and up, but not for the 12 to 15 yet. So it's authorized, but not fully approved. Pfizer has submitted some data to, um, to um, the FDA, and uh, that is for younger kids, 5 to 11, and it's with a reduced dose of the uh, antigen. So that's not yet authorized, and there, we're waiting to hear about that data. Johnson & Johnson's vaccine is a one-shot vaccine right now, and it's available for people 18 years and older, and you're considered fully vaccinated after two weeks after that shot. They have submitted some information to the FDA requesting that they um, basically add a booster to that. So we're waiting to hear about that. So if you look on our website, you can see the percent of our population ages 12 plus that is fully vaccinated. Uh, it looks like the low country has a higher percentage of fully vaccinated uh, individuals. I think the next slide is our, yes, our upstate area. Here in the upstate, we have quite a range too in terms of the percent uh, fully vaccinated. In Cherokee, you can see we have uh, about 33% uh, fully vaccinated versus McCormick, which is, has had some vaccine community champion uh, who really helped uh, help people be protected earlier on. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if uh, Director Fadir wants to add to this, but I know our vaccination teams have worked re really hard to do all sorts of outreach and make it available to anybody who wants it. So 
if you haven't been vaccinated yet or a loved one hasn't been, please, um, you know, look on our website, ask us anything. Uh, these, um, these data are also on our website. You can see that uh, the percentages of fully vaccinated individuals um, who are, uh, are in the older age groups mostly. So the older people got protected um, earlier and, that, and the younger people are lagging behind. So unfortunately we were at 29% in the younger age groups and that's probably in, in part because of hesitancy and, and also a perception that COVID might not be so bad for them. Um, which I'm, I'm hoping that people are recognizing that one is we can't predict who it's going to be bad for necessarily. We know the risk factors for severe disease, but we can't 100% tell you that just because you're 25 uh, it means that you won't have any complications from it. But also because it, there are studies now that show reduced transmission risk to others. And, and one of the following slides sort of indicates that, that one. Um, in August, uh, this is a study that was recently published, hospital hospitalizations among children and adolescents were increased by four times in those states with low levels of vaccination. And South Carolina was one of those states um, compared to states with higher levels of vaccination. So we need our community to be vaccinated to protect our children and the individuals who might not have mounted a good immune response to the first two vaccines. Um, and we can talk about that in a minute, but this slide shows you the cumulative COVID-19 cases per 100,000 children. It comes from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Every week they publish uh, a report about um, the COVID-19 cases in children in the United States. Uh, we are unfortunately second to Tennessee, which has the highest rate per 100,000 children. Um, now, the vaccine, um, the vaccines that we have are still effective, but they did lose some efficacy against infection itself when we saw the Delta variant. The Delta variant, uh, was much more easily uh, transmitted, like I said, with the higher viral loads. And it has eclipsed all the other variants in terms of being the most common one now. Uh, so persons who were fully vaccinated still had a reduced risk of infection by five times compared to those who are not fully vaccinated and a reduced risk of hospitalization and death by 10 times. And this slide is actually the graph related to that study. I thought the graph showed um, well how the, uh, the age-adjusted incidents in these outcomes, so cases on the left, hospitalizations in the middle, and deaths on the right, uh, have been almost flat if you were fully vaccinated. So that's the blue line, the blue dots in the line. So you can see that even though there was a slight increase in the number of cases among the fully vaccinated, the incidents, um, they were still pretty protected against hospitalization and death here. Those lines are flat. Whereas in July, you know, into August, uh, or well, this is just for July as the Delta variant was taken off, the cases rose rapidly, the hospitalizations rose, and the deaths rose in those who were not fully vaccinated. On DHEC's website, please go look. We have um, this graphic now being published uh, for data every two weeks where we are looking at the vaccination status and, <clears throat> and reporting it in terms of the cases, the hospitalizations and deaths. And we don't know the vaccination status on everybody, but we, we try. Uh, we have you know, case investigators who look at the reports and try to contact people and verify if they were vaccinated and when and make sure they meet these definitions. It takes an awful lot of work to get, acquire this data and make sure it's as accurate as possible. So among the cases from August 16th to September 15th where we could verify the vaccination status, you can see that 86% were not fully vaccinated. And with 
the 1,711 hospitalizations that occurred due to COVID that time, 72% of those hospitalizations were among people who were not fully vaccinated. And of the six, 760 deaths, 78% were not fully vaccinated. Um, you know, uh, there have been some vaccinated who have had complications. Often those individuals had severe comorbid conditions and maybe didn't develop immunity like, um, like well, obviously like they needed to, um, unfortunately. So this, this um, next set of slides comes from something called the Joint Commission uh, for Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations. And it is a very important uh, organization that everybody looks to in the healthcare industry. Uh, they have published this graph, set of graphics to help us understand risk um, because it is hard to understand risk. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so they use these dots to represent people one little dot is one person, and then you have the 15 people for the line there, and then the rectangle is 300 people. Now, I am terrified of sharks, um, and I would think a lot of people are, uh, but on average, I don't have much chance of being killed by a shark, even if I get in the water, probably. Uh, it's less than a year uh, in terms of less than one a year. In terms of lightning strikes, uh, we have less than 25 people probably a year uh, getting killed by lightning strikes. And for tornadoes, it's 94 people. Drownings are much more common, almost 4,000 people a year die. Traffic fatalities are a major problem, I think, here in, in South Carolina that hopefully we'll work on is when COVID gets um, somewhat under control, uh, about 38,000 people in the United States uh, die every year uh, from traffic fatalities. And that, if you put them in a stadium, you can see that it would fill almost half. Similarly with influenza for uh, the typical flu year, last year was an exception uh, in that it was not that prominent. And we'll talk about that in a minute. COVID on the other hand was, um, a dramatic change. Uh, so when we looked at deaths from January of uh, 2020 to February 2021, that was before the vaccines became available, it was about 433,971 people lost their lives. And that was enough to fill the seven stadiums. Um, <clears throat> then if you look, once vaccines became available, we had about 181,000 people who died. And there were about 1,400 people who died in that same period from February 1st to August 18th who had been vaccinated. But we hear a lot about those, um, those breakthrough cases. So we, we tend to think, oh, well, maybe they're not working as well. Well, breakthrough cases unfortunately happen with um, all vaccines. So what if the vaccinations really didn't work at all? At the time of this, um, this report, about 170 million Americans were fully vaccinated and about 165 million were unvaccinated. So it was almost a 50-50 split. If vaccinations had no effect, then the death toll would look nearly identical between vaccinated and unvaccinated. So during the week of August the 15th to the 21st, 5,564 people in the United States died from COVID. So this graph represents what it would look like if the vaccine made no difference. So vaccinated individuals in yellow and unvaccinated individuals in dark blue. Looks almost equal, but we know that what actually happened is represented in the next slide. It was almost all unvaccinated people who lost their lives in that week. And <clears throat> we hear about the, the, the terrible cases where individuals lost their lives despite being vaccinated. But um, so far, uh, the vaccines have been very protective. And I, I think the graphic can show you about that. I hope yeah, that Dr. Carlson, I think we're about out of time. I know there's time. time for questions. So sure. Sorry, I talked too much. No, you're fine. 
A lot, awful lot of information. So uh, do you have anything to wrap up before I start questions, Dr. Carlson, or was that close to the end? Well, that was, that was pretty much close to the end. We were just going to mention what boosters are versus third doses, but I can talk about that. Well, the, and, and we may get to a little bit of that maybe in questions. We're going to go mm -hmm. for about seven or eight minutes in questions, Justine, before I turn it over to you. Um, a lot of uh, good information and in the chat, um, you can um, you can read some of the specifics. I'm gonna start with uh, Susan, thank you. Uh, Susan Kastner, thank you for including what Family mm -hmm. Connection is doing. Please see that link. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have questions specifically about uh, child children and, and things of, of that nature. Um, so that is, that is available uh, for everyone. Um, Let's see. We have a question from uh, uh, Mayor Schumacher. Does DHEC track excess deaths in South Carolina? I'm not sure what that exactly means. Do you know, Dr. Carlson, what he's referring to? I, I think so. Um, we look at observed versus expected uh, for overall um, death rates. And I don't know that we have published anything, but I certainly can, can ask. I mean, that um, there were certainly studies and are ongoing studies that have shown that, you know, it's not just COVID that is um, causing people to die. It, the displacement of healthcare and our resources is leading to other effects. So, People have delayed biopsies uh, initially because they had to, and more recently because elective, elective procedures had to be postponed. And some of those were, you know, things that weren't really things that you would consider elective if you were having some abnormal spot, you know, that you needed uh, to get uh, removed and biopsied. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of delay of care, and I think yes, we are going to see more deaths than we usually would because of it. Okay. So the, the um, CDC does, and I was just wondering if we had the same data for South Carolina. I kind of use that to counter this whole COVID isn't real thing. When during the second wave, we had 20,000 deaths above normal per week. Mm -hmm. That's a, like the size of the city of Simpsonville every week. Mm -hmm. Uh, more than normal, and, and you can look back years and see that it's way above normal. I was just wondering if you had the data for South Carolina. Sorry, I, I don't right now, but I can look into it for you. Well, that's certainly an interesting way of, of you know, tracking and kind of, kind of seeing comparisons. Um, we'll move on. Um, can you talk about monoclonal antibodies? Sure. Um, Monoclonal antibodies, uh, there are uh, several options now. There, for a short amount of time, uh, we had an, an excess supply, and then <clears throat> it was recognized that they are effective at both preventing uh, disease in somebody who's been exposed and is at high risk, um, and they can be given um, now subcutaneously. For a while, they were not authorized for that. Uh, so they're an infusion of artificial sort of antibodies, right? They're not convalescent plasma that was obtained from um, recuperated or covered patients. They are actually, you know, produced antibodies that help prevent COVID um, disease. And, and just augment your body's response. So they are available, but not as available because everybody started ordering them at one time. So you, you, you need a doctor's um, order and there are certain infusion suites where you can get them IV infusion. And then some places are now switching to an inject, but they're injectable, a subcutaneous injection. Um, <clears throat> so they, they are, available to some, but you have to go through a medical provider to get them at this point. And they, they can reduce your risk of hospitalization at probably 30 to 70%. There's some varying estimates. They are okay. useful. Perfect. And you were going to talk uh, about 
third uh, shot boosters and things. And we have a question about that. Are boosters uh, necessary and how do they uh, improve efficacy or efficiency? Uh, uh, it's a, a great question. Well, <clears throat> I think, you know, the data keeps changing. So what what is currently recommended may change. Uh, there was actually a, a large study just published yesterday in the New England Journal uh, from Israel. So we, we will see, but at the moment that we'll make the distinction first is the third dose. Third dose is for individuals who receive the mRNA vaccine. So either Moderna or Pfizer, and they have an expectation because they are either moderate to severely immunocompromised that they would not mount a good response to that initial two doses. Um, <clears throat> so people might have received an organ transplant or they might have Crohn's disease or rheumatoid arthritis and be on one, on the, on one of the uh, heavy duty immunosuppressant medicines. And we know that those persons are not mounting as good of a response against those vaccines. So maybe they get 30% of them get protection. So that's not very good. But when they gave a third dose, 28 days or more, after the first two, they could get at least 50% of people often to get some you know, uh, measurable antibody titer and protection. So that was the rationale for um, initially uh, authorizing the third dose for the immunocompromised. So particularly people on those medicines, organ transplant recipients, bone marrow transplant um, patients, and uh, advanced HIV or untreated HIV disease especially. Now, and that could be for even a, the 12 and up. <clears throat> but the booster shot is, is actually for those individuals who were expected to mount a uh, normal, you know, initial antibody or an immune response to the initial vaccines, but now over time the immunity has waned, and we have seen that now in several studies with the Pfizer vaccine that uh, the immunity has waned, especially in the 65 and up um, crowd and of or population. So anybody 65 and up is who received the Pfizer vaccines before now is recommended to receive their booster dose six months later. Uh, also individuals who are at high risk for severe disease, so obesity, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, heart uh, attacks, hypertension, um, any stage of HIV, uh, <clears throat> There are a variety of different Down syndrome, other immune um, conditions that, that would predispose somebody for um, illness. In addition, um, the CDC director has expanded that recommendation to include uh, individuals who are at risk because of their occupation. So teachers, healthcare workers, um, those individuals who are frequently exposed to COVID and uh, you wouldn't want them to acquire the disease and transmit it to others. So uh, the, anybody who's in those occupations or who lives, for example, in uh, a congregate setting, like a residential setting, a long-term care facility, homeless shelter, that type of, uh, but those are not for the younger, that's 18 and up. Okay, perfect. And last question uh, we'll ask is, do you recommend getting a Johnson & Johnson shot if you had one of the Pfizer and had an allergic reaction from it? Is mixing okay? Um, that is um, obviously an individual uh, choice and something that you should talk about with your doctor, but an, an initial, depends on the reaction. Um, if there was one dose of Pfizer and there was some type of allergic reaction, we don't necessarily think that you would have the same reaction to the other, but it really depends. It would be an individual you know, risk assessment. And there is not um, 
a large amount of data, you know, for crossing vaccine types. So that is uncharted territory. Great. And so, um, uh, Dr. Fredair, I want to uh, bring you in as well as we close up. And Dr. Carlson, thank you so much. But the last thing, um, uh, Dr. Fredair, I know this is kind of in your wheelhouse. Uh, as we move forward, the um, you know, uh, Dr. Carlson talked about the that masks still have a, a place, and you know, certainly distancing and increasing the vaccine rate. But what are you all emphasizing? Uh, specifically at DHEC uh, that people uh, you know, should, should do, and especially if they're in settings where, they're, you know, where there are people who are not vaccinated, and I'm not going to get into whether uh, you know, personal choice and things of that nature, but um, you know, what are you guys emphasizing and what can people do to help support uh, you know, advancing um, the, the continued growth of, of vaccinations and, and all the things needed to uh, make us healthier and, and uh, move the vaccine or move the uh, um, COVID uh, further along? So certainly first and foremost, vaccinations. Um, so if, if I had to pinpoint it down to one thing that we wanted to focus on in terms of getting beyond COVID and, and, and getting beyond the conversation of COVID, um, vaccines are the way out of it. Um, with the lack of vaccinations, and you saw the data for, for the, the upstate area in particular, um, masking is and, and that social distancing piece are going to be the two things that we're going to need to focus on to, again, try to mitigate and, and reduce some of those exposures. Uh, in terms of uh, how we promote that, how we, we continue having those conversations, um, I'm, I'm a big believer in asking questions and getting good, reliable, scientific evidence and, and answers to my questions. Um, so the, the studies that Dr. Carlson went through today um, are, are just a, a handful of the studies that are supporting some of these decisions. So overarching moving forward as we're having conversations with our coworkers, our neighbors, our friends, our family, um, encourage people to go to those reliable sources for information. Please don't go to Facebook. <laughs> Please don't go to Twitter uh, to, to make those decisions. Um, there's a lot of information out there that quite frankly is not just incorrect, but, but very dangerous. Um, so it, go toward those, those peer-reviewed, um, scientifically vetted studies um, that are showing uh, masking and again, they're they're by far and large showing that the the effectiveness of masking and vaccinating. Um, so, big proponent of education. Um, I see Lily Hall on the line. Um, Lily is our community systems director in the in the upstate region, or she she was on there a minute ago. Um, she's worked a lot with our hospital partners, our FQHC partners, uh, and a variety of other partners across the region uh, to to really talk through how do we best educate our populations? Because uh, we, I, I, I'm not a big believer in forcing stuff on people. It's, you need to make a good informed decision and in what's right for you and your family. But, but my hope is that people are basing that off of good information. Um, but vaccinations, masking, and, um, and, and using those good scientific sources, I think are our best uh, approaches at this point. Okay, well, thank you to both both of you for taking the time and for this important uh, and detailed information. For those who have asked, uh, yes, as always, we will have uh, the, the slide deck uh, available. It will be in the summary email that I will be sending out to everyone tomorrow. It will also be on our Cat Chat webpage on our website. Uh, and, and Erica, if you could put that in the chat, it's not up there yet. It'll be up there tomorrow afternoon, but it's also uh, available on that for people. And of course, this uh, presentation is recorded and available as well. But uh, Dr. Fredier and Dr. Carlson, thank you both so much for taking the time uh, to be with us. And if you could put your contact information in chat, if anybody wants to reach out directly to you to help with um, you know, uh, getting the word out or anything along those lines, uh, we'd love for them to, to work directly with you. And again, uh, we also have uh, the information uh, that Susan um, Kastner put in about a number of workshops and things going on. So uh, 
thank you for that. Um, just now, I'm going to turn it over to you. But just before that, uh, one quick uh, announcement or reminder for everyone. Of course, uh, Congressman Duncan, unfortunately, was unable to join us uh, for our September chat because he was on the floor all day for votes. He is going to be with us on October 21st. So two weeks from today at our regular time, three o'clock, uh, hopefully there will be no votes uh, that day and no um, nothing that will keep him from being able uh, to be with us. If you had already registered for that chat, you do not need to register again. If you have not registered, Erica will put that uh, link in the chat as well. So with that, Justine, I'll turn it over and uh, I apologize to our resource folks that we have only a few minutes, but this was such an important and timely topic that uh, I appreciate uh, uh, the two doctors taking a few more minutes with us today. Justine? Thanks, Dean. Okay, Megan Rogers, let's hear from you briefly. Sorry about that. Uh, Megan Rogers is with the Carolina Center for Behavioral Health. And uh, Erica will put in the chat, we actually do have a, a health, mental health update in the upstate chat reconnect coming up on October 29th. So feel free to register for that if you would like more information. Megan. Hi, yeah, uh, I was just gonna give a little overview about what we do here at the Carolina Center for Behavioral Health. I'm the Director of Business Development. Um, and I know I've only got a couple of minutes, but if I can, I'd like to share a screen. Um, and I'll cruise through it. So we are 156 bed acute care hospital in Greer, just off Interstate 85 and Highway 14. So we're very close, um, centrally located in the upstate near Pelham Medical Center. We provide psychiatric and substance use disorder treatment. We treat adolescents ages 12 and up, uh, adults and senior adults. And we group our programming by age and then by um, program needs. So, you know, our adult substance use is all together. We've got two separate senior adult units um, based on their needs as well. And it's a group therapy model uh, with psychiatrists and therapists and nurses, of course. And we're 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So uh, people can call on their own. There's no referral that's needed. If someone's in a crisis, um, they can call us themselves or just walk in and be assessed with no obligation there. We also have a full ECT um, and TMS suite. And what that means is electroconvulsive therapy and then transcranial magnetic stimulation. We've got more information on those on our website, but that's for um, people with severe depression um, or some other diagnoses that have not been responding to medications. Um, it's a great treatment option. It's inpatient or outpatient. And then we've got outpatient programs as well. So for people who are safe at home, um, but need a little bit more than one-on-one -on -one therapy once a month or once every two weeks, uh, they may qualify for something like an intensive outpatient program, which is three days a week. And it's in a group setting with a therapist and, a, and access to a nurse uh, or a partial hospitalization program where they're coming in uh, for a full day of treatment and programming with a group uh, Monday through Saturday. And we have those programs available for adolescents and adults as well, and adult-specific substance use treatment program. And then I included our phone number here. Um, that's our main phone number. We can get our intake department uh, and my email as well. Thank you so much. I have so many questions, but we will, I guess we'll have to get to those at the Chat Reconnect on the 29th. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. And um, we also have a great, I was going to mention that Megan wrote a great article for our e-newsletter. Um, Erica put a link to that in the chat if you'd like to read it. And Carson LaCroix also wrote a very nice article for our newsletter. Carson was a recent nominee of Oconee County Chamber's top 20 under 40. Um, and he's just going to talk for a couple minutes about the Hamilton Career and Technology Center. I think he's still with us. Yeah. 
Oh, I think we, oh, Carson, I do see you, but I can't hear you. Oh, shoot, you're not muted. <laughs> you know what? How about if we, um, we do, we yes, yay. Fantastic, okay, thank you. Okay, I was gonna be worried wait that whole time and I don't get to <laughs> Give me, give me just one second, guys. Thank you for hanging with me. Let me tell you a little bit about the Hamilton Career and Technology Center. Um, out of the 3,000 high school students that we serve in Oconee County, we have about 1,000 of them that come to our building. Um, and they can take up to 20, not up to, but we offer 20 different programs um, here at the Hamilton Career and Technology Center. And our goal is to produce a high school graduate that either has college credit in their pocket when they graduate or some very meaningful work-based uh, technical training courses. So in our building, they can take auto tech, auto, auto collision, law enforcement, early childhood education, cosmetology, graphic communications, marketing, building construction, machine tool, welding, architecture and mechanical design, culinary arts, project lead the way, engineering and biomedical science, health science, sports med, CNA, emergency medical services, computer science, um, and we're also very happy uh, to have in our building a very successful transition program, which works with students who uh, receive specialized education. They're not earning a traditional high school diploma, uh, but we get out in the workplace as well and, and learn how to be more independent and, and um, have a, a job and be successful. And that includes, we actually have our own little restaurant here at HCTC that opens on Fridays um, that our transition students run everything from cooking, cleaning, uh, running the um, the cash register, the whole deal. Uh, so we're very proud of that transition program. Uh, but again, our goal is, is to graduate students and have students that are ready to enter the next phase of their life, whether it's straight into the workforce or onto Tri-County Technical College or another tech school of their choice or a four-year university. And we, we hope to give them those opportunities where they can do everything that they can um, in their life. And we are very happy um, to be in a county that is so supportive with all of our, our local business and industry partners that do offer work-based learning opportunities for some of our students while they are in high school to go earn class credit for us, but be on a job site. Um, and, and most of the time I get paid while they're doing it. So um, not a lot of people know where we are. We're on Highway 11 in Oconee County. Uh, we have a brand new building. It is a beautiful facility and uh, we are very fortunate to serve the students that we serve. It is beautiful. I checked it all out when you wrote the article and I did put the link to it, uh, the center in the chat for people. I think it's really amazing that you, can, you have this program that kids can go straight into the workplace if that's what they choose to do. Right. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for hanging out till the end so we could hear, hear a bit from you. We really, we really appreciate it. All righty, Mayor Roberts. Thank you, Justine. Carlson, you get the prize this year for being the most frustrated being muted because we could see you were not muted and you right. were trying to talk to us so you get the prize this year and also uh, the great elevator pitch i mean i think he had that oh, down no in doubt. two minutes you got it to us real quick so that's very right. good i know you're proud of your facility um i want to thank the doctors from DHEC, um both of you for giving us a great update um timely information and it's always good information so thank you for uh, joining us and hopefully you guys will see us in a couple of weeks when Congressman Duncan comes. So hope everybody has a good weekend and we'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you, Terrence. Thank you, everybody.